Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Film Chat. My name is Dineo Paramudise, and thank you for joining us this evening as we will be talking to one of the most iconic um, basketball players to come out of South Africa. And that we're just waiting to join. There we have Neo Motiba. Correct. Don't forget to leave any questions that you guys would like to ask now. Get to talk to an icon today. Let's see if. Okay, waiting for Neo Motiba. Good evening, Neo. How are you? I'm good, Mama. How are you doing? I am good. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening, taking the time to um, get us, to let us know you a little more and a little better. No, thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. Absolutely. And um, you are a, what we call a basketball icon in the country. You have captained the national team for 14 years I absolutely cannot wait to hear the stories that um, you've had building up to that long legacy that you have created. And yeah, I would just well, like I, to know I, that... I like resharing my story. So it's something that I like to do, something that I want to put out there to inspire everybody else I try to be where I am. So, I mean, it's, it's a great opportunity for me and I'm enjoying it. Absolutely. So let's start in the very beginning where you actually started playing basketball. I think you were playing cricket first before you were exposed to the game. How did you end up um, loving and falling, yeah, basically falling in love with basketball? Well, from the get-go, I think uh, my brother started playing basketball before I did. Um, I was your typical cricket boy. And I think in 1993, something like that, I actually skipped cricket practice. And um, when I got home, I tagged along with my brother to go, you know, watch them play around. And then from that day, I think I, luckily I had my shoes on and they were, I think, about three people short. So I was like, okay, well, I'll jump in. I mean, I mean, I mean how, how, how hard could it be to get the ball through that round mm -hmm. ring, right? And then eventually, uh, yeah, I started going there. So I'd go to cricket and after cricket, I would run back home to go play a bit of basketball. Uh, luckily, the two did not clash as much. And yeah, that mm -hmm. was, I think, 1993 in Soshanguve. So yeah, you just you guys just took me back a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> and what was the basketball culture like in Soshanguve back then? Hello? No, do we still have you? I think there's a network problem. Obviously, with the aspect of it, you know, the big jeans, uh, the hip hop, everything else. So, hello, can you hear me? Hello? I think we have a network problem. I don't catch much of what you said. I think we just got you back now. I don't hear much of what okay. you said. Could you kindly just repeat what you had said? Well, uh, the reason why I think I fell in love with basketball, as I said, was the whole the whole culture. Uh, you know, there was so much surrounding basketball back then. And remember then there was also the professional basketball league. So basketball was quite big in Pretoria, mm -hmm. Soshanguwe, and, and um, Atridgeville, and Mamelodi. So then, you know, and the girls liked Bom Repa, who wear those big jeans and all of that. <laughs> I got, I got My yo-yo. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, man. And obviously the whole, then I just getting into, I uh, just started getting into the love of hip hop as well. So it kind of, you know, it all boiled down to, um, you know, it, it feels like I, I can do this. And what has been your fondest moment 
throughout playing um, basketball in high school? Well, I played basketball in, well, th throughout my whole high school career. Uh, but mostly uh, back then, basketball was more a club based. Uh, so it wasn't really big at school. Yeah. It was big, big back home. But I went to a technical high school, which was not a big uh, basketball uh, school. But uh, I actually started uh, basketball at the school, I think in 1997. And then we, that year we entered the league and, you know, we came fourth. And that's when, you know, things opened up for me, I guess, uh, to be able to play. Because then that's when, you you know, you qualify to go play for your province. And, you know, you get to see, you play against people who are much better than you are. Because I always played about three years um, uh, younger. So I would be like 15 playing against 20 year olds. So for me, it was, you know, it, it, it's something that I grew up doing that um, you always you always punch above your weight. But in high school, I played basketball throughout my high school career. And it it, it was one of the best, but I think it, 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 it paved way for me. And tell us about your your first national call-up experience as a captain. What did that feel like for you? Well, for me, my first call-up was not the best. Um, I remember very clearly because I think that's one of the situations in my life that set me up to be as strong as I am mentally. Um, because in 2003, and we were invited for a national team camp. And then I was, I was a student at uh, Tuana University of Technology. It was one of those awkward moments where, you know, uh, the camp was during, was, was during our exam week. So I had to make a decision whether do I, do I go to camp or do I stay and study. And obviously I spoke to my mother about it and she said, you know what, you must make a decision. And then obviously once I made a decision to go play, I went yeah. to my lectures and told them, listen, this is what it's happening. It's a national call-up. I need to be there. You know, it's something big for me. And luckily, they understood. Um, then I went to camp. It was in Johannesburg. I remember vividly at Shaft 17. And then after two two days uh, of camp, uh, the coach was Terry Keita back then. You know, at night after training, we were all tired. They said, okay, today we're going to announce a team. So there was about 25, 24 of us. And as I was sitting there and, you know, I was this, there was this young man who, I mean, it was my first time being with the guys. And then the, the coach, you know, mentioned me 12th. So, I mean, I was excited. Like, you know what, I finally made the national team, you know, it's yeah. you know, my biggest, biggest dream to make the national team. And then the same night, uh, you know, some of the, some of the older guys called us in and said, you know what, gents, um, we have a few situations with the administration. Uh, we, we know we all have issues that, you know, things like kids and that we didn't see eye to eye with. And unfortunately, we couldn't reach a, we couldn't reach a, a you know, a, a point where we agree on anything. So the whole team decided, you know what, if we don't get our way, we're not going. We're not going to, we were supposed to go to Mozambique. So the team is not going. So, so now I was in a situation where, you know what, I could still go back home and actually write my exams or mm -hmm. do I stay here and you know what see how far it goes so I spoke to one of my one, one of the older guys in the team and I asked him and said listen this is what I'm gonna do I'm gonna because I'm with you guys all the way you know if you guys aren't playing I'm not playing if you guys are playing by all means because I'm also part of the team so I was like, they were like cool it's fine no problem so the coach called me and said, listen, what are you going to do? I'm like, coach, I'm staying with the guys, you know, um, um, I, I cannot let them down. I believe what they're fighting for. And I think it's something worth fighting for. So the coach was like, okay, you know what? Uh, basically what's going to happen is uh, we're going to have a meeting with administrators. And yeah, if you say no, then you're not part of the team anymore. So I was like, okay, so be it. So I called my mom's and my mom organized transport for me to go back home. As soon as I got home, I got a call uh, from one of the guys, uh, Tepo uh, Ditejo. He's one of, uh, uh, one of our best point guards we've ever produced in this country. And he told me, he says, yo, you will not believe this. And I said, but what? He said, listen, there's about seven or eight guys who were veterans then who decided to go back to camp 
but everybody else that left camp is 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 is, is being kicked out the team. So now here I was feeling so betrayed in my life. I'm like, you know what? I I, I, could, I could have just taken it and just stayed there. But I stood mm. by my guns, you know. Uh, there were still guys who said they're not going back, mm. and I said, you know, I stand with you guys. And that was that was supposed to be my my, my debut for the national team. And I didn't play for the national team until I got a call up again in 2005, when we were preparing to go for the uh, Afro Basket. Now there, um, our coach was we had a new we, we had a coach called Saint Vincent. Uh, he he played in the NBA for the Celtics. So I mean I was quite excited, you know, to be coached by an ex uh, Cel Boston Celtics legend. And then when we got there, we had one session, and then the second session. But by the next day, you know, he came to us and said, you know what? Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave camp. Uh, Saint Vincent was leaving camp. I'm like, but coach, why? So he's like, nah. You know, these things that are happening, that are, well, okay. So we got a new coach. He, uh, his name was the late uh, Terry Portorites. And that man was quite a character. I loved him to bits. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody else who's been involved with that guy will tell you he was, he had jokes for days. So <laughs> obviously he was new to the team. So he just came in, we started running our sets, we started running, we do everything. And then four days later it's like okay you know what i need to now we need to finalize a team uh, so what we need to uh, uh, finalize a team i think we're about 16 of us cut it down to 12 and then obviously from there uh pick the captain so i was like oh well you know what i just want to make the 12 you know what i mean i just want to just want to be part of the, the, the green and gold and then at night we got to we got to the hotel we sat down and then they announced the 12 so i was uh, like this time i was announced seventh so that was the, that was cool for me and <laughs> then and then this man is just so much in the range that okay uh neo you'll be our captain listen by then i'm the youngest guy in the group uh i don't i mean the guys that i'm playing with are veterans compared to what i was you know we had craig gilchrist Quinton, guys who played the All Africa Games in 1999, and here I am six years <laughs> wow. later, this young buck, yeah, going to be their captain. I mean, it was nerve-wracking, but you know, I took it as a learning curve because for me it was a matter of you know, obstacles are there for a reason, and even if you don't make it, if even if you don't, you don't conquer them at that particular moment in time. But the fact that you gave it your all, that's what actually builds you as a person. So, so from then I rallied uh, the guys around uh, that that I knew, which was with Quinton, uh, Craig Gilchrist. Uh, we had also Lisejo Malabazi, guys that I've been playing with, you know, on, on on the basketball circuit. And I told them, listen, James, you understand that you know this is I, I'm in, I'm I'm in deep water now. But the guys were good enough to take my hand, and you know, um, I was captain on paper, but I think I had about another seven captains with me on the court. So, you know, that was my first experience of playing for the national team. It, it was nerve-wracking, but yeah, it was a roller coaster. And moving forward, you played in the 2005, the 2007, 2009, 2017 African Championships, which are called the Afro Basket. What has the experience been like playing in all different eras of basketball developing throughout the country but and being able to basically, like, represent us at so many of those tournaments. You know what? It's it's one of those things where you keep learning all the time. Uh, for me, I think I was fortunate enough to understand and how to properly set my goals and be able to quantify exactly what was happening at any point in my life. Uh, that being, you know, uh, the team we had in 2005, 2007, I still believe is, is, is one team that could have gone very far if we had proper, uh, you know, had proper resources and everything else. But uh, that's, that's, that's one thing I keep telling people, that every time I, I, I would go overseas and we would play against the best in Africa, you know, w mm -hmm. when, whether we win or lose, but I would always come back with something that I, I either need to work on or something that I've learned. And that is why, you know, my game has uh, has been able to, you know, to keep moving forward for a good part of about 10 to 12 years. Because, you know, the experience itself, you know, you realize that there's, there's, there's a bigger picture to this. Um, 
You know, every time I practice, I would see myself playing against a guy from Angola or playing against a guy from Senegal. It wasn't about, you know, me playing against John from Mabopani. But in my head, I was thinking, you know what, I'm going to be playing against guys who are 10 times harder than this guy is. But I need to make sure that when I play, I play knowing very well that I'm going to, you know, face tougher opposition. And which is why I've been able to do a lot of work by myself, you know, off the court, out of practice, because I know that, you know, if you train two hours twice a week, you will not get to where you want to be. So that has strengthened yeah. me and, and that has made me be as, as, you know, as resilient as I am. And you also captained the national team uh, during the Commonwealth Games in 2006. How was that a different experience yeah. compared to the African Championships? Uh, well, first and foremost, I mean, it was Australia. It wasn't, it, it wasn't Cameroon. Um, you know, the Commonwealth Games were, for me, it was, it was as good as it's going to get uh, because obviously getting to the Olympics is, is, is quite, is, is quite a, a huge mountain to climb. But for me, the Commonwealth Games was an eye-opener in terms of, you know, when we went to Melbourne, you see how, how big basketball is, you know, in other countries. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you see the infrastructure, you see the people. I mean, I remember when we were playing our last game against India, and it was a game that we had to win so that we, you know, we don't come last. And we played our game, I think, at 10 o'clock in the morning. And then when we got there for a shoot around at around 7.30, uh, so we shot around for about an hour, went back to the hotel to freshen up. And then when we came back around 9, the whole, the, the whole gym was full. It was full to capacity. There was about 15,000 people at 10 o'clock in the morning. Listen, if you go to any basketball venue in South Africa at 10 o'clock in the morning, you'll have an echo. You'll be talking to yourself. But it was, you know, it was a huge, it, it was a great experience um, for me to play in front of, you know, 15,000 people and, you know, to do what you love doing. Uh, it, it, it was an eye opener and I had a brilliant game that, that game. And, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where you, you can't really, uh, you know, you can't put into perspective exactly how I felt that time, but it was, it is tremendous. And also then looking at the Basketball National League, you have won two championships with Tony Sons and you've also played for Igoli Magic. How has that experience been, being able to play in the National League? Well, the Basketball National League for me was, was I mean, it, it got me so excited. You know, I was so excited to be able to play on a semi-professional uh, semi level at home, you know, in front of your own yeah. people. And obviously seeing, you know, how far the game could go. And obviously playing for Twenty Sons for me was, was, was one of my dreams come true because, um, you know, back in the day, like funny enough, the team that I, I, my brother used to play for, which I subsequently played for, it was called uh, Soshanguve Sons. So mm. I, I believe that, it, you know, it was written. And uh, obviously during the PBL, you know, I, I would watch them play and all of this. I was like, you know what, one day I want to play for them. So in 2003, when Coach uh, Coach McKenna asked me, listen, do you, this is what is happening. Would you like to be part of the of the 20 Suns? I was like, but that's no brainer. Obviously, I want to be part of the 20 Suns. <laughs> and luckily, I was I was part of the committee that actually formed it, that, you know, got to find players. And, and I made sure that, you know what, we had a team that was that was very strong and but we had guys that were very hard working you know playing the first three years of the basketball national team uh, national league when i was playing you know i i i could see us getting to the nba in in 10 years or so i know that was sounded naive but you know what the the, the you know the the ambience at, at wembley you know especially when juicy royals came in you know, we knew that we had to bring it every day. Um, I remember when we were we were at practice. You know, I think our practice sessions at Tony Sons were more intense than most of the games that we've played because you had 12 guys that wanted to be that wanted to be in such a lineup. It the Nash, the basketball national league for me was was you know it, it was one of those things where I was like you know what South Africa has made it. You know, we we we, we mm. were gonna get there. 
And yeah, well, you know what? We won the first two seasons and lost the third one where we were going for the treble. And then the following year, I played like a month for a goalie magic. But that, uh, to me, I don't, I, I, I don't even, you know what? Even if they won that year, I still wouldn't want to get a, a ring from them because, I mean, I only played a month then. But there was so much promise from the Basketball National League. You know, there were so many people trying to be part of the Basketball National League back then that I, I, I basically saw, saw this league 10 years from now being as big as the one in Angola. Well, obviously, fast forward seven years from then, obviously things have happened, some things didn't happen, but not, that's neither mm. here nor there, you know. Uh, I still believe that we've got the right infrastructure and I think we've got the right uh, the right people who are not in very influential positions in basketball to be able for us to have a crack at it one more time. And what do you think is still needed to improve basketball administration in our country? You know what? Um, administratively, I think uh, guys need to look themselves in the mirror and think that, you know what, um, does the sport owe you anything? Uh, I, I'm a firm believer that the sport doesn't owe anybody. And I am where I am because of basketball. You know, basketball gave me an education. Basketball made me the man that I am. So I owe nothing to the game. So when I'm called upon to serve the game, I, I go there 100%. So administratively, we need people who have basketball interest at heart. Uh, you know, not just people who just want to play, but people who are willing to fight for basketball holistically, you know, uh, uh, guys who will be able to go the extra mile to make sure that, you know, the kids that are coming mm -hmm. up, you know, play basketball the right way. And in order for you to play basketball the right way, somebody has to be there to fight the, the battles behind the scenes. So it's, it, it's a matter of guys sitting down and understanding that, you know what, we are not where we want to be, but we, we, we really glad that we were not where we were two, three decades ago. Uh, but it's, it's one of those days where, you know, we need the right people in the office. We need people who understand, people who've been at the ground, people who understand what a basketball program needs, you know, not just what a basketball player needs. But it's yeah. one of those days where guys need to come in, you know, get their hands dirty and just make sure that the next generation does not you know, does not fall in the same trap where we did, where you've got 10 years of no proper or no proper competition, basically, in order for them to reach the next level. Yeah. And what valuable principles have you been able to learn from the game of basketball? Uh, the one thing I've learned, and, I've, and I tell this to everyone that actually is, is, is willing to lend me an ear, is that, you know, basketball does not build character. It just reveals it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you, you got to have it in you in order to be successful in anything that you, you have, you know, from, where, from, from how you prioritize everything that you do in life. If you want to be a great basketball player, you have to go back and, and, and do the research, find out how other people have gotten there, uh, you know, Things like being disciplined, you know, saying that you're going to do something, actually getting down dirty and doing it, you know. Um, the one thing that's synonymous with me, obviously, will be my, my Miyagi swag, which is basically everything that I do. Um, you know, everything that you do, you do it to the best of your ability. If the next person is going to beat you, he needs to beat you because he's a hundred times better than you are, not because he's outworked you. You know, every boy's got the same amount of hours in a day. It just all depends on how we want to use them. And that's the one that I've carried with me for the past 20 years, 25 years of playing basketball. You know, um, the ability to be, to, 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 to set your mind at a goal and be able to achieve it and still have the hunger to achieve even more. You know, I'm, I'm 38 years old. Uh, you know, most people by now, most of my friends are already thinking, you know what, the retirement, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm still at it. I'm still, for me, you know, ball is life. Ball is life. That's it. That's right. and, yeah. and how do you think the private, sec private sectors can get involved in basically helping grow and develop basketball in the country? 
Well, the, for me, the private sector, you know, when you say the private sector, it, it sounds very ambiguous and it sounds very daunting. But I think the, the, the one thing that I always tell people is that in the basketball circle, we have people who have the means and have the influence in the private sector to be able to, 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 um, to affect change, you know what I mean? So, you know, we've got guys who are marketing geniuses, guys who, you know, who, who, who can actually bring basketball to where it's going to be. So in order for us, for, for these people who, who've, who've actually benefited from being part of basketball, you know, playing the game, having people behind the scenes, making sure that they are actually playing. They need to look themselves in the mirror and say, listen, basketball has given me so much. How can I give back to it? The nitty gritties will come in once we all sit down and say, okay, here's where we want to go. But I mean, the private sector will, let's face it, if, if, if we're going to depend on government for everything that we do, you know, we're not going to go anywhere. Uh, but I believe that there's yeah. a lot of guys who are in, who, who are in, in, in very, very strategic positions in big companies who are ex-basketball players. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. they, 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 they don't even want to touch it with a long rope. So I, that's my calling. And I've always been calling out guys who, 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 who've got the means, you know, not that they must take out their own money, but, you know, use their influence in whatever sector they're in to actually benefit the kids that are coming up. And to any aspiring basketball player or any aspiring professional basketball player, any athlete that is watching right now, what words of encouragement um, would you give them? Because you've always been known to be a fighter. So how um, does one get as disciplined and as determined as you? Well, I guess it, it, it all starts off with proper goal setting. Um, you you got to know what is it that you want to achieve. You know, you know you're not going to know exactly what you want to do. I mean, that's part of life. But, you know, you've you got to have goals in life that you need to achieve. Long-term goals, short-term goals. You know, uh, every, a journey of a thousand miles starts with, a, with the first step. So you got to be able to take that first step, you know. Um, if, you say, if you say that you want to be the greatest player alive, you look at those that you look up to who are, in your eyes, the greatest players alive and try and emulate what they do and then try and actually go above and beyond, you know. Um, you know, when I started doing my 5 a.m. workouts, um, I, it, it, it's one of those things where I watched a, a, um, a documentary on Kobe Bryant where, you know, the guy would wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, you know, he would do yeah. a 6, 6, 6 workout. And I thought, you know what, I want to be like that guy, you know, I want to. But then you realize that it's not just what you see on the court, you know, it's everything else that happens before when the lights are off, yeah. you know. It's it's one of those things where you have to dig deeper, you know, do research. You know, you don't you're not just gonna learn the game from just watching, you know. You have to watch documentaries, read books, find out, you know, from a nutritional point of view. That way you'll be able to, to do whatever you need to do. So, you know, developing good habits and, and, and when you develop good habits, you're able to achieve anything that you want to achieve. And then before we look at the questions that people have posted up for you, I just have one question to ask. What vision do you have for South African basketball? Well, my vision for basketball is pretty simple. I just want, I just want us to, you know, to be able to compete at international level in the next 15 years or so. Um, you know, we, we just need to, 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 to start laying the foundation properly, you know, uh, not just not yeah. just put things up there and hopefully that we will you know hopefully that everything will come according, uh, according to where we want it to be we need to you know make sure that these kids when they grow up and when they look at guys that came before them and say you know what i am who i am because of that guy not no you know i i, I mean I've, I've been lucky you know uh, when i was i think about 19 six, yeah, 18, 19. And then I moved to Atridgeville to go play for a team uh, called uh, uh, Atridgeville Bullets. It's one of the strongest teams in the country. And we had about five or six guys that played in the, in the PBL. You know, those guys used to push me. So when I look back at it now and I look at what I've been able to achieve and I think, you know what, it's those guys back then that actually helped me 
to, to, to be disciplined to, because I had to work hard for my spot then. And from there, I've, I've, I've never looked back. So that's why I want the guys that are playing now, you know, and the yeah. guys that are coming in the future to be able to say, you know what, that guy laid the foundation for us to be able to do what we love to do. Absolutely right. And so we're going to look at the first question here. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. But they say, which great um, basketball player of the NBA has inspired your life as a player? Well, I, well, for me, you know what? There's, 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 there's a few players that comes to mind, you know, because I take bits and pieces of, 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 of people that, that I, there's no perfect person for me. Uh, you know, you, you will never be a hundred percent. So I always take, but the one person, obviously, actually two people for me, is obviously the great Michael Jordan, and then uh, the second one would be uh, Kevin Garnett. Uh, I've tried mm -hmm. to, you know, I've tried to take bits and pieces of 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 them, and obviously uh, try and emulate them as much as I can. But for me, mm -hmm. you know, when I was growing up. Um, uh, see, I'm the kind of guy who, when I was growing up, I was not your flashy type of guy, crossover, whatnot. The one thing that I could do, I would just beat you with aggressiveness and, and, and hunger and everything else, you know, try and dunk each and every ball that I get, get each and every rebound. And obviously, as the skills came along with time, then I started, you know, learning to dribble the ball and all of that. So I would say someone like Kevin Garnett, and then obviously, as I moved on, a bit more of Michael Jordan. And Ipileng Nyatlo says, what are the things that you learned in your basketball um, international exposure that you want players from South Africa who haven't had that opportunity to know? Well, the, the one thing that I've learned myself from playing, and obviously it, 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 it might be different from other people, is that, um, you know, I, I, when I play, like, I, I usually go play in my melody in, in the off-season or during the week or whatever. And I, before I leave home, I, I actually do my own practice plan. I, I, I make sure that I've got, a, I've got something that I'm going to do or focus on when I get there. So I always look at it as if I'm, if, if I'm going to practice and whoever I'm playing against, I need to, I need to think of, the next person, the next level, you know, uh, I don't care who I'm playing against on the court. In my mind, I'm playing against that guy from Senegal, that guy who's six foot five, six foot six. He's got a 40 inch vertical, can defend and everything else. So my mindset is there. That's why most guys always tell me that, you know what, when you go play against guys that are shorter than you, maybe my melody, we never see you post them up. And for me, I always tell them, listen, where I'm going to play in the next four or five months from now. I'm not going to be playing against a guy who's five foot, five foot one, you know, uh, and me posting mm -hmm. him. I'm going to be playing against a guy who's six foot eight, who's as strong as I am, tall as I am. So I need to make sure that I'm, I'm going to use him, that person who's five foot eight, who's quicker than I am. I'm going to use him to build my foot speed, you know. And if I'm yeah. playing against a guy who's, who, who's taller than I am, and he'll be like, then, but he's tall. Why are you posting? I'm like, yeah, well... At my, at, at my height, you might find a situation where you've got a mismatch somewhere. So I'm going to post at the biggest guy and be able to take care of him with a low block. So all my experiences have, have, led, have shaped the way that I approach the game. Um, I don't take anything for granted. I, I, I make sure that every moment that I spend on the court, it, 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 it's, it's worth my time. Burn Sugar says, how do I, be I think it means become part of the team. Are you still playing basketball? Do you still play or have yeah. you, you still playing? Which team do you still play for? Uh, I play for the great Josie Nuggets. Uh, we just came second in the Johannesburg Basketball League. And we qualified for the Basketball Africa League uh, second round, well, the first round which were held, was held in, 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 uh, in Wembley. So I'm still playing. That's amazing. You still play. So yeah, Bern Sugar says, how do I become part of the team? Uh, well, I guess it all depends where Brown Sugar is from. Um, 
I mean, we are Jersey Nuggets. You can go onto our uh, Facebook page, Instagram page, all the social media networks and get on hold there and ask exactly all the questions that you might need. But we're always open for guys to come around. And we also have a ladies team. We also have an under-18 team as well for men. So, yeah, we, we, you know, everybody's welcome. And the last question, just before we let you go, it is Ipileng Nyatra again, who says, which character traits do you think makes a great basketball player to you? Uh, you know what, it's... it's I think everybody, everybody has, has has a certain amount of or a certain level of of greatness in them, but it mm -hmm. all starts with the mindset and and how you approach everything in life. You know, they say ball is life, and I always tell them that. You know, the lessons that I've learned from basketball, I've been able to take them to my to my work and everything else. So character traits, I mean, you know, you gotta have a you gotta be strong minded. You know. Um, Basketball is a very, uh, it, it requires a lot from you uh, to be able to get to where you want to be. So you got to have a strong mind, be able to fight through everything else that, that, you know, that might potentially distract you from your goal. And that, those are life lessons, you know. Um, I've learned a lot from the game and it has helped me so much uh, in, 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 in life as well. And obviously I'm trying to impart that knowledge to all the kids that I come you know, into contact with on a daily basis. On the fact that you said that the team that you play for does have um, a female team, do you have a favorite South African basketball player that is a woman? For me, my, my woman. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's quite a, there's quite a few. Huh? Uh, well, my favorite basketball player of all time in South Africa will have to be uh, Pumla Satula. You know, okay. uh, she's. Yeah, to me, she embodies, you know, uh, 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 what a basketball player should be, you know. She should be, you know, resilient, uh, you know. She played in the States for a few years, came back, still bowling even now. You know, uh, every time I speak to her, I always tell her, listen, you know what, you got you to gotta come and tell your story. Um, you know, she, she, she's, a, she's, a, she's a tremendous person. And yeah, for me, but there's quite a few, you know, there's, there's, there's also Lungi uh, Lemtsueni, uh, who's also a good friend of mine. You know, there's, 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 there's quite a few. Emma Ledwaba, who's, who's been part of the national team for a while. You know, and there was this other uh, lady called Tuki Murisele. I'll never forget that lady's jump shot. But there's been, there's been quite a few. But the one that sticks, that, 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 definitely pops into my head would be Pumla Satula. Um, no, thank you so much for giving us the time to get to talk to you and engage and become interactive with you. I've been reading through the comments. People have been spreading some love. I don't know if you've been looking through them, but um, there's people that are watching from Kenya. There's someone watching from Kenya. Um, people are just saying how much of an icon yeah. you are. So it has been such an amazing experience getting to talk to you. And the fact that you are still playing makes you such a phenomenal and amazing um, basketball legend. And it was such an honor to get the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much for having me. I know everybody out there, please uh, stay safe and we will get bowling as soon as all this is done. Absolutely. Thank you and have a great evening. Enjoy yourself. Thank you. Bye. Bye.